keep my mind about the stress So I always be my sickness I don't trust no corporation Cause they lie like politicians I don't Welcome to a very special third edition of Rare Talk Podcast If you're listening to this, stretch, uh, drink some water Take a deep breath, it's underrated But more importantly, I'm here with Sarah Begum from London Who has a very, very incredible story And I'd like her to tell a little bit about what you're doing with your life And over the past couple of years Because it's truly incredible Thank you. Um, well, I've just been doing what I love. Like I literally, I, I just managed to uh, follow my dreams and make things happen. It all started in the Amazon rainforest. So when I was nine years old, I learned about deforestation in the Amazon and ever since it became my dream to go there. I wanted to learn how this indigenous tribe in the jungle live and I wanted to save the trees. Mm. So at the um, age of 21, I decided to make my dream come true. I quit my job. I won an award to be the youngest person ever to make a first film in the Amazon. I hired a cinematographer and sound man mm. from New York and London. Um, and I just went out there. And I was with the Warani tribe. <sighs> They're amazing. That's so amazing. That's awesome. I ran into her on the street. She needed to charge her phone. And, you know, you meet a lot of people, some cool people here and there. Not everybody I would invite on the podcast, but I checked out some of her stuff. I heard her story. I saw all of her endeavors. I believe you were in Venezuela as well, correct? Yeah. Doing undercover journalism, living with tribes in Africa. And really, I think when you do things like that, you have a very rare perspective. And that's what this show's about. So... Maybe we could talk about some of the things you learned from them and, you know, maybe knowledge and wisdom and just culture that you picked up while living with that tribe. Sure. I mean, tell me what exactly do you want to know? I guess I would say like the top gem that changed you when you came back, when you, you know, what did what different perspective did you have after living with them? I know that's a broad question, but you could pick <laughs> okay, pick a so, few, pick the, the rarest. I mean, of the there's, rare. there's a huge difference because... We are in the West, we're civilized, we are in a developed nation, and it's completely, it's completely different in every single way. I feel that the rawness isn't here. I felt that nature, the primal essence was just stripped away when I got back. I mean, a lot of people focus on things that don't matter. That was probably the um, the biggest lesson that I learned. That here we're so lost in things that don't matter. Mm. We're so concerned with details that aren't going to value us or our lives or benefit us in any way. You know, I just thought, right, there's so many things out there that I want to learn, that I want to achieve, and uh, that will benefit someone else's life. Mm. I want to do that will fulfill mine and, and give us a purpose but I don't know the Amazon just put everything into perspective and having traveled the world living with different communities and learning about different cultures I just feel that in this time in this era we really need to focus on things that matter for example the planet mm. you know climate change is real it really matters taking care of the planet really matters taking care of ourselves and our bodies matters mm. from our diet to our decisions and the choices that we make that nourish us as a human being and define us as an individual yeah i just feel that we need to invest ourselves in um in things of higher purpose but that's that's just me did you find that what things do we have that your tribe doesn't have per se you know privileges and access to things what do, what do you see in London and the United States that we have that they don't? And also, how do you feel about the happiness level of them compared to here in London? Because like you said, a lot of people out here, they make big problems in their head and they're really concerned about all the yeah. things that don't matter. Okay, <laughs> to answer your first question, um, they, have, they don't have a lot of things that we have. We have tools and... We have buildings and a whole bunch of other things. We have a developed nation. So we have a man-made world. They don't have a lot of tools. They don't have any of that. 
they don't even have currency. And I think that was the most um, prominent thing that stood out for me. That's interesting. The fact that they live in a world without currency. So when they want something, they have to go out and they have to hunt for it. It's a life and a mentality, a world of survival. Mm. You literally have to do the work, put in the work to reap the rewards. And living in a world with no currency was very interesting because it just, everything was down to you. And there's no real politics either. Mm. How is the sense of community like, since it was so tribal, for lack of a better word? I mean, it was very strong. They have a very strong community. The um, elders are very well respected mm -hmm. um, and they work together. Like everyone has their own roles within the tribe to make the community work, I guess. And just for people listening, what area was it again? This and was the in exact Ecuador. Tribe? But okay. I mean, even in the Atlas Mountains of Aruca Valley in Morocco, the Berber tribe, they're the same. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. How was crime since, you know, I guess the law of the land and currency, things that are everyday normal to us just didn't exist there. What was the crime like? Crime there rate? is no crime in the jungle. But if the, you're talking about when I was in Venezuela, the crime was the highest in the world. I was, um, you know, scared sometimes because I was living in a place where murderers dump dead bodies um, and people get shot for their mobile phones not being up to date like it was crazy that was the highest crime in the world i was in krakow in poland and that's called the city of knives so i was investigating football hooligan gangs um and there i actually befriended them which was interesting <laughs> but um there everywhere you go you can smell death like they just in poland to... yeah in krakow in poland just because of the football players or the soccer. football hooligans uh, fo okay, football hooligan gangs. So there are who like their team more than the other teams, so they want to exactly. kill it's other not, people. It's not just that. So okay, the football. There's you have the football team. Mm -hmm. You have the football team, and then you have the gangs. The football teams don't want don't want to be associated in any way with the hooligan gangs. Okay. And the gangs, they okay, they practice fighting every night. They have night fights every night, um, in an undisclosed. Uh, area um, they train all day in the gym or in fight clubs to prepare I even joined them mm -hmm. um, and they want to avenge the death of one of their friends so that's why it's like a vicious cycle it's continuous and someone needs to break the cycle unless the cycle is broken it's just going to continue because mm. that's all they've known it's interesting. And what about Venezuela? How come you know it got so bad there? What What did you see firsthand? Um, you know, I when I went there, I didn't, I didn't witness any, anything, so morbid. Luckily, but um, I heard lots of stories. Uh, I mean, people used to get shot in their cars in the middle of traffic. Um, there was no toilet paper. I remember queuing up a really long time uh, in the slums just to get shampoo. So, I mean, that's a completely different world. And then I did a, a, a road trip around the USA filming the Native Americans. And that was interesting because they have to spend like $100 to buy wood just to uh, make a fire to keep warm because there's no heating or water even in some of their houses. Um, or they can't get jobs that pay enough. They can only get jobs as waitresses or cleaners, and they want more for their for themselves and for their lives. But it's it's really sad because they're in one of the most developed nations in the world, but they have to live, or they are living like that. I say that all the time too, and I think people think I'm joking. I, I say I love water. You know, everyone loves alcohol or maybe soda. Um, but these things are not guaranteed and you know, I always use the stat I believe it's billions of people don't have access to clean sanitation and our perspectives are so skewed by being So privileged with all this technology and wealth that the average person creates so much and self manifests so much stress Over things that if you go to a tribe in the Amazon or to Venezuela, you know, that would be their best day would be our worst day so it's uh, I mean, I mean the happiness there. That's one thing that I didn't touch on some of, some of the people that I met, or a lot of the people that I met rather, 
They were so happy with not having... A, well, that wasn't the reason for their happiness. They were so happy regardless of not having much. Mm. So they they knew how to live with it. They knew how to deal with it. And I guess the more you have sometimes creates more problems, as we are well aware. But over there, they just... Um, they knew how to just keep a positive frame of mind. Again, it goes back to survival. That that does feed their survival instincts. You have to stay positive to stay alive, I guess. Absolutely. And to continue with life. 100% here, it's, it's really sad. You know, I, I talk about a lot on here and on my Facebook page about how negative and bad the news is. And I understand having opinions on social issues and whatnot but the the pure negativity that you never see on the news they never tell people hey you know you're doing pretty well or you know even your lowest end job is a high end job considered uh for where the planet is at it's very strange but i guess that's why we're here and you know i think that's a part of why you're here to spread that perspective i have a question because you mentioned climate change and that's it's kind of fallen off the wayside because American politics have gotten so ridiculous over the last year. Okay. But it's a polarizing topic. There's a lot of environmentalists so who, you know, exactly, you know, they're saying it's real, it's happening. There's some people who are like, I think it might be happening. I think it might not be happening, but I'm not sure if man is truly causing it. And to that, as someone that I consider myself an environmentalist, I'm torn in the sense of I feel like a lot of people who speak about it, politicians, they don't address the core issues of it, and they certainly never take steps to counter it. So, what do you what do you think could help? And and you know how how real is it? How real of a threat is it? How real is it? Recently, I was in Ghana for about uh, just under a year, and there was a UNESCO World Heritage site I went to visit. It's called Lake Bottom Tree. Beautiful place, beautiful place, and. It really is a unique part of the culture and part of the country. But the lake has been shrinking for the past uh, 10 or so years due to climate change, yeah. global warming. It's a huge increase in, in But not only that, it's there. because the, um, the trees nearby are cut, being cut down so then the people can make houses. Mm -hmm. They can build their houses. So as a result... So you've seen it firsthand. I've seen it firsthand, and I've you know they have records and they sh show me the evidence. Um, they've they've given me the um, statistics and the numbers of how much it has shrunk over how many years. How much influence do you think man directly has on that? You know, well, like I said, in, and we see it even they here. cut down the trees to build houses for them mm -hmm. for themselves. So that's that's one impact, mm -hmm. one negative impact, causing global warming so I, I always think uh, I mean clim climate change sorry yeah, uh, yeah. Same, I mean it's heating in so certain parts and yeah. the climate is certainly changing two people because I know even here you have people who argue it is happening people who oh man might not have that big of an influence on it but it seems like both sides of the debate are more interested in yelling at each other than actually contributing to oh society oh my gosh okay when I, when I watch um political debates or campaigns rather mm -hmm. whichever i just it's so funny because the politicians are so focused on um catching each other out and mm -hmm. and slagging off the other party instead of the issues that they can make better for the people and they talk about fossil fuel we got to stop climate change we got to stop fossil fuel if you know i've watched multiple documentaries done a lot of research the animal agriculture industry is very largely responsible for it i believe up to upwards of 50% of U.S. land is for the animal agriculture industry. Yeah. And I always say, you know, regardless of what you think is happening, every cause has a reaction. So the fact that we're cutting down all these trees, we're using plastic when we could use natural resources, we're dumping stuff in the oceans, we have a, a moral decay of some sort, so yeah. there's like no morality anymore. All of these have to have an influence on the planet, uh, you know, one way or another. So instead of psychoanalyzing and, and measuring that's all great but even i find the politicians that talk about global warming it seems like they do have a financial agenda because they never mention the animal agriculture industry i've never heard a uh, politician say hey maybe we could like stop dumping plastic in the oceans so that you know or protect this species of animal absolutely which are dying out i believe it's always um rates. it's always uh an area for charitable organizations to 
you know, clean up or to take care of and focus on because I haven't really seen that many government initiatives focus on such issues as you've said, not only in the developed world, but around the world. Have you seen, have you had any run-ins with um, charities such as like the Red Cross or the big ones? Have you crossed paths with them? Not the Red Cross specifically, but various charities. Doing good stuff or any big ones that, because I know a lot of people here, we had a big Houston tragedy, big Puerto Rico tragedy, and people in Texas and in Puerto Rico that I talked to, they said the big organizations that everyone donates to don't really do that much. It's a lot of smaller organizations and local churches and stuff. I haven't, not any big ones, but I was with a um, a smaller charity when I went to the Philippines, and this is in 2000, and I think it was 15, was it 15, when the, um, when the Typhoon Haiyan hit, oh, I can't remember what year, mm-hmm. <laughs> when the Typhoon Haiyan hit the Philippines, so I went with this charity to um, a village called Lanao in Cebu, mm-hmm. in, on Cebu Island, and I was also uh, skeptical. Like I went to film, um, make a documentary about the aftermath of this uh, of the typhoon, um, and the, get the stories of the survivors out there. So when I went, I remember um, seeing all this cash from donations that they had collected, and I was carefully observing where it was going, and being included in the meetings. I actually realized, well, they're actually giving every penny to the cause. Oh, that's great. Of course, yeah. there's some like 1% admin fee, which is understandable. Yeah, and I mean, there's going to be a percent, because I know sometimes I, when 7% or 5% goes to the actual cause, that's when yeah. it starts, but if there's 5 no, or 10% no, 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 no. that goes it's, to the I mean, people. that's completely, I mean, it, I mean, it blew me away, it, and it put faith in me. In that's charities. great. Good but, to hear. I mean, yeah, but the uh, the documentary that I made well, I raised enough money to rebuild the entire village, like houses in the entire village. That's incredible. And that's uh, someone who puts their foot forward instead of just talking about it, being about it. And I think if everyone did their part like that, you know, things could change. But a lot of people, it's a lot of talking and not so much action. I want to ask you with all of your travels, you know, you've done a lot of great things. You have a big documentary that was successful got a lot of press you've done undercover journalism um what's a strong message that you say to people who maybe haven't traveled or that feel a certain way about other people of other races religions genders cultures what's the overarching theme or a message that you would like to share if you could okay um just be open be open and explore you're curious, like don't judge, like wait, listen, listen for it, <laughs> and then um, ask questions. Don't be closed minded, because if you're closed minded, you just, <laughs> you might lose out on something. I, I believe that everybody comes together for a reason. Everyone meets for a reason, whether it's a message, a lesson, a sign, or that person is supposed to be in their lives, a, a new friend that you acquire. Because you learn from each other. We as human beings are put on this planet to meet one another, to learn from one another, to be inspired and motivated by one another. Yesterday on the train, I I had my card and I I left my cash in a different handbag. So I had to take the train and I didn't even know how to take it. I was like, damn, I can't even get an Uber from this place. I don't know what to do. I met this young girl who helped me out Um, And as we started talking, she told me she was an actress and she's always wanted to travel. So I was telling her a little bit about my travel. She said, Sarah, Sarah, I've been thinking about this for a while now. I really want to travel, but I don't really know where to go, how to start. I'm a young woman, like, can I travel by myself? So I just said, we're meant to meet for a reason. You help me out. And I'm supposed to tell you um, at the end of the year whether or not you're going to extend your visa because she's stressed about whether she's going to... Um, get another visa to Mm -hmm. stay longer she she was like I really want to travel but I really want my visa to work out I said okay if your visa doesn't work out don't stress because that's the time for you to travel and you're supposed to meet me now for me to tell you that follow your instincts and you see a lot of you know when you project what you think about other people and other cultures or take the negative parts maybe you know it almost seems like it's 
inner generated and media generated where when you go out on the street when you talk to people in los angeles there's definitely some weirdos on the street but oh definitely <laughs> <laughs> we have a surplus I know, so many david lynch characters like uh, but <laughs> besides that it's like you meet a lot of good people and all this this uh race religion gender yeah. um you know no, diversion I'm, I'm, is, it doesn't really exist yeah. in the real world that much i mean i'm a woman of the world i don't look at race and if I do, I look at it with, an, with a perspective of beauty. I love seeing different cultures and different people. I love seeing fusions and learning about their backgrounds and their roots. And I just love all of that. I love when people come together. Like, mm. I love diversity. But um, I think that we can learn from one another, from different cultures. We can, they can teach me something that's helpful to my life that I never thought of because I wasn't raised in that environment or that culture and I can give them something from my culture that can help them mm-hmm. and together we're stronger Absolutely. Uh, that's how I feel Absolutely. Uh, and regardless of race or religion as well mm-hmm. like I believe that because um, I respect all races and all religions like I really don't care who you are where you're from or what you believe in for me, it's the soul that matters. Absolutely. I want to know the person, the soul inside that body, beyond the color, beyond the skin or the eye color or whatever. Like, I don't care. Absolutely. Yeah. That's real. Uh, anything else you would like to add to, you know, the people of the world? Any, any over? People of the world. <laughs> yeah, you know, we have listeners from all over. I, I got messages from Syria and, you know, every culture and religion i think when you stop hating and projecting yeah. so much of your idea and, and you're more open you you attract what you put out so we have people from all over but i just yeah. think i think be open and don't judge anyone um just love one another i think love is the highest frequency it's the best thing you can do if, if someone's different from you just be just be happy smile at them like if don't try to stereotype without getting to know the person inside Absolutely. and i think a lot of the times we do that and the media has a big part in how we perceive others Absolutely. so to just totally. because the media has uh, racially profiled a specific kind of group of people racially politically religiously yeah, whichever i mean they're, way. they're ruining everything don't really. let that brainwash you Mm. don't don't believe that everyone of that look or that religion is going to be that way and on that note i do really like to tell people how you react to things the energy you put out it does change other people as well if you walk around and you look for the worst if you think these people are racist or you think these people hate you because of this and that you're going to find the negativity in others and maybe bring that energy out of them and then you might project your thoughts onto them but if you go into situations loving and considering and you know winning with kindness you can disarm a lot of people and also bring out the best in people and and the world is a beautiful place that you didn't even know existed because the the mind is so so powerful and that's that's one of the main things i try to reach out to people they ask how do you stay so positive and this and that it's such a crazy you have to stay positive if you're without 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 positivity i think it's the best time ever i think it's a, a beautiful world uh you know i think every aspect of my life even on the worst day i'm incredibly lucky to have the resources i have so it's like the power of the mind and and the soul and the heart is truly powerful and it's very very underrated nowadays we put all of our power into technology and blah 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 what other people are doing in tv and movies but people don't understand how powerful they truly are and and, you know once you get to that level the the whole world is not such a scary terrible place i i completely agree And I think a lot of people need to, uh, especially if you're depressed Mm. or you're sad or concerned about something that's happening in your life, think about what's the worst that can happen and think about how you can turn that into a positive rather than how that will destroy you. Because if you start thinking in that positive mindset, and believe me, Ghana has really tested me. (laughs) I've been in so many situations and I had to keep, you know, keep, positive keep finding a way to stay positive to make things work yeah and so i was meant mentally challenged out there so each experience <laughs> happens for a reason and it teaches you something specific for you to learn and apply to the rest of your life if if you're going through a bad situation in your life right now think about what 
things you could do proactively to make it better. And that will refocus your mind um, and strategize your mind to make you active doing things that will make you happier instead of dwelling and focusing on whatever that was negative. And I found that's the best way to live because you grow and you're constantly in um, in a beautiful, happy zone, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I'm so glad we had Sarah on. I literally ran into her on the street. We, we started talking and I realized what a beautiful person she was Thank inside you. and out. <laughs> Incredible perspective. And she really encaptured what the Rare Talk podcast is about. You know, I told her that I do the Facebook stuff. I get political sometimes. You know, things happen where I, I get in on certain subjects. But my true mission in life and also with the podcast is I'm trying to bring all perspectives around and there's no better person to really be on the third episode than Sarah. So thank you, thank you so much for being on. Thank you for the truth, knowledge, wisdom, rare perspective on Rare Talk. Get one more word in there, just whatever you, whatever comes to mind. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>